Okay, and the masked professor is on the air once more. So hooray for first participation. Finally, everything is hooked up and running and ready to go. Um, okay, so I looked at chapter 18 and um, uh, we had essentially done the rank ordering uh, order clustering, uh, uh, but the from to charts and the string charts, uh, I'm going to hold off until we get to facility design class. So there. Instead, we will plunge gaily into chapter 19, multi-station manufacturing systems that are automated for flexibility. All right, so we're going to go through defining manufacturing flexibility, what are the components of a flexible manufacturing system, analysis of flexible manufacturing systems and alternative approaches to ma uh, flexible manufacturing. All right, so the um, flexible manufacturing system, 
versus an automated production line. Well, I'm, at this rate, I'm going to have to back up and go over automated production lines. Um, both are multi-station automated uh, manufacturing systems. Um, automated production fit uh, system, automated production lines, though, are fixed automation to produce parts in high volume. Uh, flexible manufacturing system are, uh, are flexible automation that produce parts in the mid-volume, mid-variety range. As with cellular manufacturing, flexible manufacturing is going to rely on the concept of part families. So a part family, to remind you, since it's been all the way since last Monday that you heard it, uh, consists of parts whose features are similar enough that they can be processed on the same machine. The definition of manufacturing flexibility is the capability of a manufacturing system to adapt to changes in operating requirements and variations in the parts or products it produces. So those changes and variations can include the production mix, uh, production schedule, excuse me, the part mix, new part introductions, machine breakdowns, and raw material deviations. All right, so what are the types of flexibility that we can have? First, we can have a part variety type of flexibility where we are processing different parts or product styles in a mixed model uh, mode, but not in batches. We can have a part mix flexibility where we change the proportions of different part or product styles that are produced. We can have volume flexibility, where we increase or decrease our total production quantities. Uh, routing flexibility, where we provide alternative routings amongst workstations for parts that are processed in the system. And so let's talk about part variety flexibility. This is a basic characteristic of flexible automation. It includes the capability to make uh, design changes in the current parts and to introduce new part designs so long as they're members of the part family. Okay, so it assumes uh, that the similarity to parts that it is already producing is close enough that we're not radically altering the uh, methods and machines needed. Enablers, well, one is the ability to identify different incoming work units so that the correct sequence of operations can be applied. Uh, obviously, this is extremely important. A quick changeover of operating instructions, in other words, the part programs. A quick changeover of the physical setup. Um, uh, 
which uh, can be accomplished, of course, when we're talking about part mix flexibility. Our part mix refers to the relative proportions of different parts or products that are made by the system. So, uh, we let P sub J be the part mix fraction for part si style J, where J equals 1, 2, dot, 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 up to P. <coughs> capital P, I should say. Where capital P equals the total number of different parts or products. Our part mix fractions are determined by the production schedule. All of our values of P sub J must sum to unity. In other words, we can't have greater than 100% part and don't even try it. Volume flexibility uh, is uh, the ease with which our total output for a given period can be increased or decreased to satisfy changing demand requirements. Uh, if the system normally operates at less than 100% capacity, then increasing or decreasing the output is possible. If it's uh, op already operating at 100% capacity, then increasing our output is difficult. Uh, if we decrease the output, that means that our fixed cost of equipment per unit of output increases. Now, of course, if we're operating at, uh, one uh, idea they've left out is, if we're operating at 100% capacity, we can always decrease even though we can't increase. We may be able to increase, increase if we're at a 100% capacity if, uh, if we're only running one or two shifts a day. We can have the machine do some overtime. Uh, routing flexibility in that case, our part has more than one possible sequence of stations that can be used for its processing. Um, so as the number of alternative sequences increases, our routing flexibility increases. This is uh, very important if we have a machine breakdown in the normal process sequence. Uh, so if we have uh, alternative machines that can be programmed to do uh, part of the processing that other machines, uh, another machine or other machines can do, uh, then that has to be programmed into that machine. And our routing flexibility increases when the number of workstations of any given type increases. All right, so here we see a robot-centered manufacturing cell. We have an automated cell where we have two machine tools and a robot that transfers parts between the car carousel and the machine tools. Is it flexible? 
Um, I'm going to say yes. Um, uh, since we have already defined a flexible manufacturing system as one where our uh, uh, where we can have a variable routing, uh, we're not really told if these two CNC machine centers have the same tools work the same parts in the same way or not. All right, so the authors answer that question for us. Is the robotic work cell flexible? Uh, we ask, do we have part variety flexibility? Can the cell process different part configurations in a mix rather than batches. All right, that would make it flexible. The part mix variety, can the part mix be changed? Uh, our volume flexibility, can the total output be increased or decreased? Routing flexibility. Are alternative routings available among stations in the case of a machine breakdown? So is, I would say, if any one of these questions can be answered yes, then we have a flexible manufacturing system. All right, so our flexible manufacturing systems can be classified according to the number of processing machines or workstations. A single machine flexible cell, we say N is equal to one. A flexible manufacturing cell, we say N is equal to two or three and a flexible manufacturing system, uh, or FMS, N is equal to four or more. Now the dividing line there between a manufacturing cell and a flexible manufacturing system, I'm a little dubious, but okay. We're gonna just go with it for the moment. So, in our flexible manufacturing system, our linear pallet system is transferring parts on pallets between load and unload stations, storage, and machining stations. Um, okay, so here's our load, unload, um, uh, Look, uh, pallet uh, mover, right? It's on ra rails. It can load a pallet with a part on it into any of these um, any of these uh, uh, machines. All right, so uh, we have our three types of flexible manufacturing systems, uh, right? Again, it's by the number of machines. One means a single machine flexible cell. A flexible manufacturing cell has two or three machines, and a flexible manufacturing system has four or more. So the flexibility type we can have, part variety flexibility, well, that's limited when we only have a single machine. In the flexible manufacturing cell, 
we have the possibility of uh, simultaneous processing of different parts. And in a flexible manufacturing uh, system, having more machines increases our part variety flexibility. A part mix flexibility, again, is limited by a single machine. The part mix flexibility is possible in a flexible manufacturing cell, but it may be limited by only having a few machines. And the more machines we have, the more that increases part mix flexibility. Our volume flexibility, again, is limited by a single machine. Uh, it's limited in a flexible manufacturing cell by having minimum machine redundancy. Uh, and in a flexible manufacturing system, more machines increases our volume of flexibility. In uh, routing flexibility, well, a single machine cell has no routing flexibility. It's got one place to go, that's it. In a flexible manufacturing cell, we have limited routing flexibility. But in a flexible manufacturing system, having more machines means more routing flexibility. All right, so the benefits that we would see from having manufacturing flexibility, first, we have a reduced inventory compared to batch production. Okay, well, reducing inventory, good. Uh, we have more responsiveness to changes lower manufacturing lead times, uh, high machine utilization, fewer machines, and less factory floor spusv. Sp okay. I can't stand the misspelling. And less factory floor space. Um, another benefit is high labor productivity. Since humans aren't doing very much, uh, we should be able to get a, an optimal uh, number of human beings working to amount of work. And it's possible that we have the opportunity for unattended uh, operation, or the so-called lights out operation, where we leave the machinery working even as we go home and have dinner and go to sleep, etc. So, our flexible manufacturing system components. Of course, we have workstations. We are going to have to have uh, computer numerical controlled machining stations. We're going to have to have load and unload stations. And we're going to have to have assembly. We need a part handling and storage system, a computer control system, and we'll need people to manage and operate the system. Um, 
of course, as time goes by, that will be needed less and less. All right, so what uh, duties are going to be performed by the human labor for our machine overlords? Um, oh, wait, no, not machine overlords, sorry. What a mistake on my part. Um, first of all, loading and unloading the parts from the system. Uh, that seems inevitable, at least in the near term. Changing and setting the cutting tools is uh, going to be necessary. Uh, maintenance and repair of the equipment. The numerical controlled part programming. Programming and operating the computer system. and overall management of the system. So, the functions of a part handling system, we're going to have to have access for loading and unloading the system. Um, we're going to need our parts to be able to move independently between the stations. And we have to have accurate positioning of the parts at the processing stations. We have to be able to handle a variety of part configurations. Uh, so we may have a standard pallet fixture base or a work holding fixture or jig that can be adapted. We're going to need temporary storage and all of this has to have compatibility with the computer control. All right, so our flexible manufacturing system, part handling equipment, and layouts. First of all, we're going to have to have a primary handling system. That is going to end up establishing our basic flexible manufacturing system layout. And it's going to move the parts between the stations. We're going to have to have a secondary handling system to accept pallets from the primary handling system at the workstation. Um, it's going to have to position the parts on pallets accurately relative to the machine work end. And it's going to have to transfer those pallets back to the primary handling system. Uh, so the primary handling system is going to be moving the pallets uh, around. And then the secondary handling system or systems is going to have to take that pallet, put it in the machine accurately, uh, so that it, the part can be worked on and then take the pallet back out of the machine and put it back on the primary handling system. All right, so here we see uh, a flexible manufacturing system that has an inline layout. All right, so our workflow is from the left over to the right. We have a part transport system. Uh, so we have a loading station which takes the part and puts it on the part transport system. We have a CNC uh, vertical milling center 
CNC horizontal milling center, CNC vertical milling center, CNC horizontal milling center, uh, another and then another two vertical milling centers, and then and unload um, an unload system at the end. All right, so this has one directional flow. It's a, uh, we assume it's a well-defined processing sequence that is similar for all the work units. Our workflow goes from left to right through the same workstations. Um, so it's like a uh, uh, it's like an assembly line or a transfer line, except we may have different processes on the different work units. In this case, there is no secondary handling system. Everything is done by the primary handling system. Okay, so then we discuss the flexible manufacturing system with an inline layout. In this case, we have two directional uh, workflow because we use a part transport system that has a shuttle cart uh, back and forth. So our two directional flow is enabled by the shuttle cart and the automatic uh, pallet changers at each station. Right here we have our secondary handling systems. So uh, that way our parts can be transferred from any station to any other station in the system. Here's another uh, idea for a flexible manufacturing system with an inline layout. Uh, so in this case, we have parts on pallets. Uh, here they're on, uh, we have shelves for the parts on the pallets. We have a shovel cart and we have a load unload stations over here. All right, here we have a flexible manufacturing system with a loop layout. Um, we have a load unload station uh, a part uh, um, we have parts moving on pallets through the system and uh, we have a secondary system for taking those parts on pallets off the primary handling system and uh, loading them in the machines, letting the machines do their work, and putting them back on. Again, our parts can be transferred between any two stations because it's a continuous loop. Here we're seeing a flexible manufacturing system with an open field layout. So the idea here is that we have a multiplicity of loops and ladders so that large part families can be accommodated. Right, so you can see that we have AGVs working 
and those AGVs can deliver to any of the workstations. All right, so you remember this uh, uh, illustration from earlier, um, and we're going to call this a robot-centered cell. So this is uh, suited to the handling of rotational parts and turning operations. So we have two CNC machine centers, a parts carousel, a robot, and our parts can be moved by the robot from the carousel to one of the machines, uh, from one machine to the other, and back to the carousel. So our flexible manufacturing system, computer control system, uh, first of all, our workstations require control. Uh, so, and we usually computerize those controls. We have a delivery of our control instructions to our workstations. So, we need what they're calling a central intelligence um, to coordinate our processing at the individual stations. Uh, we need production control uh, for product mix, machine scheduling, and the other uh, planning functions. Uh, again, some production planning and production control can be done by the central computer network some is going to end up being done by humans, at least for now. So our computer is also going to control our primary handling system. Uh, so it manages our primary handling system to move the parts between the workstations and it's also going to have to control the secondary handling system uh, and coordinate it with the primary handling system. Our computer is also going to have to function as tool control. So the tool location, it has to keep track of where those tools are in the system. Tool life monitoring, uh, keeping track of how much each tool is used, particularly um, cutting tools, and determines uh, when to replace worn tools. And then we're going to have performance monitoring and reporting. So the availability of the machine, the utilization of the machines, the production pieces uh, as they have been produced. So we get, uh, in this way, we get real-time status on the demand for particular tools, particularly uh, particular parts, uh, particular machines. And we expect our computer to have diagnostics so it can diagnose malfunction causes and recommend repairs. All right, 
So when we talk about analysis of flexible manufacturing system, uh, flexible manufacturing system technique analysis techniques, first of all, we can have deterministic models. Second, we can have queuing models. Third, we can have discrete event simulation. And four, we might have some other approach, including heuristics or rules of thumb uh, to tell us what, uh, where we are. In deterministic models, we uh, either uh, we have a bottleneck model, so uh, we have the ec uh, estimates of the production rate, estimates of utilization, other measures uh, for uh, our given product mix. Or we might have the extended bottleneck model where we also have a work in process feature on the basic model. Uh, so, uh, we see that for any given part mix, our total production rate is ultimately limited by the bottleneck station. Right? I can say almost exactly the same thing for any production system uh, or any factory. The bottlenecks control how much we can get through. Now maybe we can get around that by adding time, either going into overtime or doing uh, another shift. Um, uh, so there are ways around bottlenecks, but bottlenecks are always going to control our rate of production. Uh, hence the theory of constraints where uh, uh, where we say if we have a bottleneck then we want to lower the constraint. In other words, make it easier to produce more at that station. And then we add, uh, uh, then we can uh, 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 then we can identify the new bottleneck because something will always be the bottleneck. All right, so if our part mix ratios can be relaxed, we may find it possible to increase our total flexible manufacturing system production rate by increasing the utilization of non-bottleneck stations, right? So if we can get some machines to perform the same operations uh, done at the bottleneck station, then we may be able to increase our production either temporarily or permanently. So we can always use our bottleneck model as our first approximation to estimate the number of servers of every type uh, to achieve a specified production rate. Uh,
So for a given part mix or product mix, our total production rate of the flexible manufacturing system is going to be limited by productive ca capacity of the bottleneck station. Again, that's the station with maximum workload per server. Um, again, if we have to change drastically the number of uh, units produced, just adding more capacity at the bottleneck is only going to move the bottleneck somewhere else. If our part or product mix fractions can be relaxed, we may be able to increase our total flexible manufacturing system production rate by increasing utilization of non-bottleneck stations. Okay, so we have stations that have a lot of slack. If they can perform the functions that uh, ordinarily would be done at the bottleneck station, we may be able to get around. We also want to consider that the number of our work parts in the flexible manufacturing system at any time should be greater than the number of servers at the processing stations. So their estimate is that two parts per server is an optimal number. Uh, uh, that may be true, but uh, that also is going to depend on the rate of loading, unloading, and working, uh, working our uh, parts. All right, so if our number of work in, in process is too low, the production rate and utilization of the system are going to be um, reduced relative to our maximum values. Um, uh, so that is our situation here in A where when we go above a certain number of parts, our manufacturing lead time starts going up. Uh, uh, if our work in process is too high, our manufacturing lead time will increase, but we won't have a, an improvement in our production rate or our utilization. So we may have economic reasons that we want uh, parts to be placed in temporary storage within our flexible manufacturing system. Uh, to facilitate uh, the unattended operation of the system. In other words, the kind of a lights out operation. We're, uh, if we're going to have that kind of operation, we have to resign ourselves to, okay, we have a large number of parts in storage here that the system will work on overnight uh, while, uh, while we're home sleeping. Or watching TV or whatever we're doing. So, 
again, as a first approximation, we can use the bottleneck model to estimate the number of servers for each station. So, or, in other words, the number of processing machines of each type. Uh, so that we can get to a specific production rate for the flexible manufacturing system. Well, that's what the equations tell us. All right, so what are some alternative things that we might do in flexible manufacturing that makes it more attractive? Well, one thing would be mass customization. Uh, we offer uh, mostly or even all customization of parts that do, uh, parts and products that do a certain job. Uh, so this might be uh, an attractive uh, situation. Uh, we might have a reconfigurable manufacturing system. In other words, we can move things around um, uh, more easily, and that may just be moving the parts around, not actually moving the machines around uh, to be able to achieve our goals. And the third uh, uh, approach is that of agile manufacturing, the ability to quickly change between part families, products uh, in our manufacturing system. All right, so in mass customization, each part, uh, each product is customized for the, the specifications of an individual customer. Um, so uh, certain products are already more or less mass customized. Um, uh, airplanes, for example, uh, you may have some that are the same, but every, uh, every airline can order airplanes and say, well, we want this seating configuration, um, uh, this galley configuration, and so on. Uh, uh, so, to achieve mass customization, first of all, we design our products so that they can be readily customized, right? We may design just a base model product and say, these features can be made as you wish to make it customizable. Uh, we might have a soft product variety in other words, there's very small differences between our different products' uh, styles. We might have de design modularity where uh, our modules can be assembled in various combinations and achieve customization that way. Uh, for example, that was the whole business plan behind Dell computers when they first started. The idea that you can order your computer and it has as many hard drives as you want, it has as many disk drives as you want, it has the type of motherboard and processor that you want on down the line. And that was very easy to achieve because the uh, IBM PC, uh, they already had open architecture so that anyone could use it, and it had that flexibility built into it. Or we could use postponement. 
So in that case, we wait till the last possible moment to complete the product. Uh, so a, an example of that kind of, uh, of customization would be uh, making carpeting or rugs, right? The carpeting itself is, uh, uh, has very basic components that are all the same until we get to the part where we add the color. All right, a reconfigurable manufacturing system, or RMSS, uh, uh, a reconfigurable manufacturing system is designed so product capacity can be increased or decreased and that its physical structure can be uh, quickly altered if we have part style changes and won't have to do major renovations to the structure. Um, right, again, the change in configuration might be a virtual one rather than an actual physical change. So, what allows reconfigurability? Well, customized flexibility in our products, convertibility, scalability, modularity, integratability, Okay, I'm sorry, that one tickles me a little. Uh, and diagnostics ability, right? So being able to have these as part of our products um, and designing that in as part of our system from the beginning gives us a lot of uh, flexibility. Our, uh, when we talk about agile manufacturing companies, uh, they have four characteristics. First of all, they're organized to master change. Uh, so in other words, they're expecting that it will be a changing environment and that we'll have new market opportunities and we need to be able to change what we're making, what we're doing, in order to uh, react to that. They leverage the impact of the people and information so that we have the resources that the personnel need to, uh, to change quickly. Uh, cooperate to enhance competitiveness. Uh, in that case, we're talking about partnering with other companies so that we can have virtual enterprise, enterprises. Enriching the customer. Producing the products that are perceived by the customers as solutions to problems. Okay, so um, what would you say is a product that is perceived by customers as a solution to a problem? thought of it that way before myself. I would say though, for example, uh, we could think of our uh, phones, our cellular phones that we use as a solution to a problem. 
Uh, I certainly did when I bought my first one. I bought my first one after I was trying to stop at a payphone and call uh, some friends. Uh, and I went to five different locations where there was no more payphone. There was just wires sticking out of a wall. We could also look at cars as being a solution to a problem. Uh, we have a problem in transportation, particularly in this area, because there's very little tr public transportation. It doesn't necessarily go where we want. And um, there are long distances in between, uh, in, in between destinations. And whatever you do, don't forget this work is copyright. So don't be stealing it. All right, are there any questions? I'm going to take that as no questions. Um, all right, so. Your homework for this week is uh, three questions doing rank order clustering such as we were doing before. Uh, the only difference is the third one, you have to actually create the uh, machine part incidence diagram before you can get on with the rank order cluster. Are there any questions about that? Okay, well, that's exciting. Uh, such being the case, all right, I'm wondering why we're even bothering to tune into Zoom Uh, such being the case, I'm going to ask you to let me off a few minutes early today. Uh, and we will pick up next uh, uh, next Monday. and talk briefly about quality control. Have you already had quality control class? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then it'll be all be new and exciting to you. All right, uh, if I haven't said so already, Please be careful this weekend, um, and uh, we will uh, meet uh, when the fields are white with daisies, or call it next Monday at 2 o'clock.